measure. This is a warning to Finland right now, a country that could soon join the NATO alliance. Moscow tonight says if that happens, Russia will respond. Correspondent Kelly Meyer is live for us in Washington tonight with the very latest on this new threat. Kelly. Good evening, Marty. Well, we know it was Ukraine's hope of joining NATO that in part provoked Vladimir Putin's invasion. Now Finland is expressing interest in joining the alliance and Russia isn't happy. As Finland weighs becoming a member of NATO, it's hit not only by a cyber attack, but has its airspace breached. <inaudible> this all happening as Ukrainian President Zelensky was speaking virtually to members of Finland's parliament. The websites of both the Finnish defense and foreign ministry went down. They didn't say who was behind the cyber attack. But Finland is accusing Russia of repeated incursions of its airspace over the last several weeks, including today. This all happening as Finland debates joining NATO, a policy change after decades of staying out of the alliance, and about face brought on by the attack on Ukraine. NATO's chief says Finland would be warmly welcomed. We will respect the decision regardless of what the conclusion will be. But if Finland the, the decides to apply for membership, I. I'm confident that uh, NATO allies will warmly welcome them. Finland shares a border with Russia running 800 miles, the longest border with Russia among all EU countries. If Finland were to join the alliance, the total land border between the NATO territory and Russia would more than double to nearly 1,600 miles. Today, the Pentagon spokesperson reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to defend NATO allies. That would include Finland if their membership is approved by the alliance in the coming months. Russian officials are threatening Finland if it goes ahead and joins NATO. Do you you take those threats seriously. As you've heard President Biden say, we're going to defend every inch of NATO territory if it's if it's required. It's an ironclad commitment. The United States uh, states uh, believes that, um, and we'll continue to look for ways to, especially on the eastern flank, to, to bolster that. Sweden also weighing joining the alliance. Russian officials have responded with threats. A government spokesman warning of military and political consequences. While a veteran Russian lawmaker said if Finland joins NATO, it would ensure the, quote, destruction of their country. Finland has responded with defiance. Many Finns citing the heavy losses on the Russian army the last time Russia invaded their country in 1939. And is moving forward with plans to join NATO and angering their giant neighbor to the east. And Finland could be announcing their decision on whether or not to join NATO just within the next few weeks. Marnie? We'll be watching that. Kelly, curious, how is Finland preparing? What steps are they taking for a possible threat? Well, we're already hearing that Finnish officials say they are preparing uh, for whatever Russia may, may do. But we do know that just because they are applying to be in NATO, that doesn't mean the Article 5 commitments kick in. As you heard the Pentagon spokesperson tell me there, that once they are uh, in NATO, that is, it is their duty to come and defend uh, NATO territory. But whether or not that kicks in as this application process goes through, how long that takes, and whether or not Russia steps in before this all goes through, that's the question. But we know that Finland is preparing and knows that Russia is unpredictable. This would be very significant and also change the game. Kelly Meyer live for us in D.C. As always, Kelly, thank you. I want to bring in retired Lieutenant General Richard Newton now uh, to talk about this. Uh, let's begin with Finland since that's where we left off with Kelly. Uh, Lieutenant General Richard Newton, always good to see you. So Finland signaling interest in joining NATO. Russia, as you heard, was quick to respond to that. Your thoughts on this latest, as I said, pretty significant development if it were to happen. Well, it is significant, Marty, and, and good evening. It would be significant because now it would be the 31st member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, think about this, 20 years ago, uh, I think it would have been unfathomable for the population of Finland to consider you know, joining NATO. But since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia back on the 24th of February, my, my numbers tell me that the polling now among the Finland population, the adult population is up to 53%, which is really a dramatic change from the last five, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and so as Kelly reported also, uh, there have been aircraft intrusions, fighter aircraft intrusions over the skies of, of Finland, but also Sweden. You know, Sweden is lurking out there as well. Both nations and especially Finland has a very capable military that would be very suitable aligned with uh, the capabilities within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So again, it, it's there are many, many steps to get there, but it's certainly one that I think is 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 dramatic and, and absolutely noteworthy. 
And as we look at the map there, General, 800 miles or so that Finland shares with the border of Russia. Given Russia's military capability, what we've seen them do uh, stymied in much of Ukraine for the last six weeks in certain areas is an attack on Finland or Sweden or Norway or, um, heaven forbid, anywhere else if they continue to, to look to push plausible? I think it is. Uh, and that 800 mile border, by the way, is not only border that's ground, but also air. So there's lots of air defense that has to go along that border as well. But I think not only should we be concerned about about Finland, of course, but but the Baltic states writ large, uh, and uh, certainly Poland. Poland has, I think, 330 miles or so border uh, on Ukraine, and so there are there is concern in NATO. My sources tell me that uh, not only within. Ukraine, but also within the Eastern Front, if you will, where we have put a lot of defensive capabilities there because of the, the most recent invasion. So that's that would be in play as well. So think Finland, obviously think uh, the Baltic states, particularly Poland. I guess what I was getting at is about 15 to 20 percent of Russia's military um, might has been diminished. They're, they're in Ukraine. Their focus is there. Are they capable militarily for another ground battle like we're seeing in Ukraine in another bordering country like Finland? I mean, the, the logistics of those challenges. They're not. And I wouldn't think in terms of a ground invasion, but certainly they, they have air capability. Got it. Uh, they also have cyber capability. And so uh, we have to think not necessarily the ground domain, but the other domains, especially in air and cyber. But they do have certainly the will. They do not have the capability, I believe, right now because they are bogged down and significantly committed and spent, if you will, uh, with this Ukrainian invasion for the moment. So that probably has put them back a year or two. But let's not take the air capability off the table or certainly cyber. Yeah, anything's possible. I hear you. Uh, General, the Donbass region is bracing for this next massive attack that does appear imminent. It's setting up to be the biggest and bloodiest battle yet. What are you hearing from your sources tonight? I'm hearing that the Russian forces are uh, they're resetting. They've moved into Belarus. They've also moved into Russia. There are still some forces committed, but they, they've lost Kyiv. They're not going to take Kyiv. So they're now going to refocus, uh, re-strategize, if you will, and, and move into the, uh, the eastern part of Ukraine. And let's not forget the southern, southeastern part of Ukraine as well. But nonetheless, what we saw today, earlier today, that pinpoint attack on that train station, think of Chicago's Union Station being attacked and 52 people, men, women, and children, and elderly killed as they're fleeing from a war scene. And so the change that we're seeing, or the really upping the ante of the civilian atrocities, will just intensify while the Russian army resets and, if you will, reloads. Mm, it's the epitome of evil, uh, really what Zelensky alluded to earlier today, uh, the atrocities we're seeing. General, before I let you go, many um, are talking about this May 9th day, marking that on the calendar. Why is that day significant for Vladimir Putin and for Russia? Well, that's the uh, the Russians' victory war parade. And if you recall the old granular black and white pictures of Stalin waving at the crowds and Khrushchev and Brezhnev and so forth, that with, with Putin being such a historic uh, focused person on the old Soviet Union, I believe we just need to kind of really keep an eye on that date as we march towards over the next month now. The 9th of May will be significant, I believe, for Putin to pull something else out of his, you know, out of his back pocket in terms of uh, either atrocities or maybe start an invasion or restart the invasion and so forth. Uh, we need to just, I'm just coming up on the net and and letting the American people know that, that that's a date that's coming, that it could compel Putin because of the historic significance of that date and his marker on his legacy with this invasion that hasn't gone so well, uh, may want to put that date uh, in play and it's just, just more to, uh, uh, we'll see on that note. Yeah, about four weeks from now in the picture, he looks to paint for the Russian people and for the world at this point. Uh, Lieutenant General Richard Newton, always a pleasure to have you on. I appreciate your insight once again tonight. You bet. Good evening, Marnie. Thank you. Ukraine has held off a full-scale invasion for more than a month now, something that surprised a lot of experts who feared that the capital city of Kyiv would fall in a matter of days. We know that did not happen. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has been the vocal face of the resistance, being praised for his tactics, his bravery, his leadership. But behind him, there's someone else, the commander-in-chief who is quietly leading this fight, his number two. He is known as the Iron General. He is the brains, the execution behind the strategies that has put Russian forces on their heels. We want to introduce you to him tonight. Correspondent Kelly Beeson here with his story, his background, who he is, and he's certainly capable of doing the job. 
He certainly is, or appears to be, Marnie. Yeah. And it sounds like from an expert we spoke with, what's really critical is for these troops on the ground to feel supported, not only militarily, but also politically. <laughs> Outnumbered by Russian forces, some predicted Ukraine would easily surrender after being invaded. However, the Ukrainians have held their own and fought back under the direction of their commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, a leader keeping a low profile. If you attack a country, you should expect that country to be extremely uh, resilient because they know their streets, they know their buildings, they know. Uh, where best to, to fight. Retired Master Sergeant from the California National Guard, Paul Wade, says the group has had a close working relationship with the Ukraine military and the Ukraine National Guard since 1993. The program was based on an American suggestion to NATO and had many objectives, including helping the nations become more interoperable with NATO forces, helping the partners become more transparent in military affairs, and helping the nations know how a military works in a democracy. It's, it's a way to uh, friendships, relationships, uh, mentorship, uh, um, share knowledge as we got further into the Iraq and Afghanistan wars that became even more prominent. Um, but, it, but for the most part, it's a chance just to uh, uh, share capabilities and knowledge um, for the worst case scenarios. Wade says he isn't surprised to see the Ukrainians passionately fighting, adding one of the most important things leadership can do is let them know they're supported both politically and militarily. If there's somebody that's the spokesperson or their poster child um, so they can get behind that person, then yes, you need a, you need a, a Schwarzkopf or you need a, a POW or you need, you know, name hundreds of other generals um, in the U.S. military that have done that. And while this Iron General is keeping a low profile, Marnie, it appears he is making those moves. Uh, really fascinating. All right. Thank Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.